Well, good morning. Let us continue worshiping by opening up our hymnals to number 130, God Will Take Care of You. Let us unite together in saying our Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he ascended from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From whence shall come to judge the quick and the dead? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning again and welcome. I'm glad to see you all. As you can notice, Nathan is not here this morning. He is with Shauna getting trained in godly play over in Augusta, Georgia. Um, I asked him this morning how it was going, and he responded with, going great. So hopefully we'll get some more details coming soon, but at least it's all good news. If you look to the back of your bulletin, we have some announcements that we should uh, pay attention to. Tonight is the Youth Open House. That's for all Parents, volunteers, youth, anyone who's interested, that's tonight at 5. We'll have a meal together and talk about what's coming up in the fall. Also, next week is the youth back-to-school kickoff, which is going to be a fun night back here at the church, either in the courtyard or by the offices. In one of those buildings, we'll have some games and we'll have a lot of fun. Uh, This Wednesday is starting back pretty much everything, the children's Wednesday Night Live, All that fun that we get that I haven't had experienced yet, but I've heard a number of good things about. I um, do want to remind you, though, if you plan on doing the $77 for the semester of all the meals, that is due by tomorrow at noon. So if you want to do that, please contact the office by tomorrow at noon. 
And then another exciting announcement is Nathan will now be doing Disciple Bible Study coming Sundays, starting Sunday the 19th. If you're interested, there's an insert in your bulletin that you can cut out for registration. Nathan is overly excited because he said it's the largest group he's ever had for a single disciple Bible study. So he is very excited to be sharing that all with you. Um, one other thing from the announcements is that the worship committee, it says on the calendar that it is coming on uh, Tuesday the 14th, but that is incorrect. The worship committee will be the 28th, so two weeks later. And then a very special announcement to one of our great servants of the church, Mr. Bobby Hughes. It is his birthday today. Yeah. <laughs> and Nancy Watts. All right, we got a couple of good birthdays today. Yeah. So it's a good day of celebration. <laughs> <laughs> well, as we turn to our pastoral prayer, I want to offer up a few names to you to be in remembrance. Dorothy Baxter, Mary Henson, Harriet Coondy, Mark Vickery, Bill Whitten, Jim Roberts, Greg Wise, and Don Tatum. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. <laughs> Loving God, your goodness is all around us, but sometimes it's hard to see with the pains of life before us. Assure us in times of doubt that you are a God of resurrection. May our lips sing your praise and may our lives be a living sacrifice for you. Lord, help us to be faithful even when we know that we face fear. Remind us that we are your children even when we feel inadequate. We know that you have overcome giants and crosses and all things evil. Help us in our unbelief. On this time of starting back in school and starting back in the fall, we thank you for the dreams that we all have and share, for the dreams of the young and for the dreams of the old. Fill us with wonder and give us childlike audacity to believe in your kingdom. Make us sensitive to your spirit so we can recognize us, so, you, so we can recognize you when you lead us. Help us to live lives that are ready to respond to your call. Form us into true disciples. Lord, we thank you for your son who taught us what it meant to be a disciple. And we thank you that he also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today is a special day. It is our annual Blessing of the Backpacks, Promotion Sunday, and educate, Educator Awareness Sunday. So we got a lot going on. So children, come on forward. And bring your backpacks if you got them. And then I want to go ahead and invite all youth to stand, all college students, all teachers, anyone involved with going back to school in any way. Would you please stand? And we will pray over you as the year comes. <laughs> if 
And before we pray, I just want to have a huge thank you to Lisa and Nancy for all they do in putting all this together. And I also want to thank an anonymous donor who filled these backpacks and also provided emergency clothing for Golson Elementary. Let us pray. Gracious God, we lift to you today these students. They stand here ready to receive your blessings and they commit themselves to study and learning in, your school, in their school. We ask your blessing on each of them. Further, we ask your blessing on these backpacks. They will hold the schoolwork of each student and will be carried from home to school and back again. As these students carry these backpacks, may they be reminded of the love and care of this congregation that surrounds them for their school year. We pray as well for the teachers and administrations in our school. May they also be sustained by your blessing. May they be reminded that this congregation embraces their call to teaching and learning and surrounds them with love and care as well. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, who we seek to follow day by day. Amen. Did everybody get one now? All right. Hey, this is a captive audience down here. I even brought my backpack with me. I sure did. I did. I usually have it full of stuff. I'm so excited about going back to school. Are y'all excited? Yeah. Oh, that wasn't very good. I'm, I, you are, aren't you, Jameson? Do you know what my favorite part of going back to school is? Lunchtime! Woohoo! <laughs> I love lunchtime. How many of you eat in the lunchroom? You do? Okay. Yo, my, I like to eat in that lunchroom. Now, you're too young to remember, but some of these people out here will remember how the lunchroom ladies used to make those rolls. Oh, look, look, at, look at them drooling up there and the cinnamon rolls. Woo, they were good. Those rolls were so good. How many of you bring your lunch? All right. What's your favorite thing to eat in the lunchroom? Um, pizza. Pizza, of course. What's your favorite thing? Pizza. pizza. How many of you bring your lunch? Me. What's your favorite thing to eat in your lunch? Uh, sandwich. A sandwich? What about you, Miller Brook? What? A sandwich. A sandwich. What about you? Fish sticks. Fish sticks. Wow. All right, Jackson, what do you put in yours? Junk food. Junk food. That, I'm going to eat with him. <laughs> well, you know, when we take our lunch, we most of the time take a sandwich and we have a bread. What's your favorite thing to put on that bread? What's your favorite thing to put on bread, Jack? Tomatoes. That's my kind of boy right there. What kind, what's your favorite thing? I almost called her Leslie. Ham. Ham, all right. Jameson, what you put on your bread? Jelly. I like to spread mine with a lot of butter. Peanut butter and jelly, that's right. Well, bread is an important part of our diet. It is mine. I like my bread. But you know what? In the Bible, it tells us that bread is important too. If you remember, uh, there was a story about the Israelites that were out in the desert and they were starving. And God provided them with heavenly bread. They'd wake up every morning and have bread ready for them. That's called breakfast on the table, isn't it? And then you remember the story that we talked about a couple of weeks ago about the little boy who had the five loaves and the two fishes. Bread was important there. And do you remember what Jesus taught his disciples to pray? We just prayed it. What was that? Do you remember? Give us this day our daily bread. That's right. So bread has been around for a long time, hasn't it? And when we're hungry, that's good to eat that bread. It satisfies our hunger. But what happens the next day? I'm hungry again. Uh-huh. I'm hungry again. You got to do it all over again. But you know what? There's some bread in the Bible that you can take and never hunger again. And Jesus says that he is the bread of life. Now bread comes in many different things, in different ways. Look, that's some raisin cinnamon bread, 
good old sliced bread right there, light bread. And that's what I had for breakfast this morning, an English muffin. So bread comes in different types of things. But Jesus is the bread of life. He never changes. And he says that he is the bread of life. And if we take him, we hunger no more. So this week when you're at school and you're eating your lunch and you think about that bread, you think about Jesus because Jesus is the bread of life. And if you let him in your heart, you will live forever. Let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Dear Lord, we just thank you that Jesus is the bread of life and that we can have eternal life through him. And I pray especially for these children that go back to school, that they will take you with them and always know that you are with them. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. And you can go to children's church now. <laughs> Will the ushers please come forward? Let us pray. Lord, I just want to thank you for all the ways that we have worshipped you already today. Through worship of song, through worship of our prayers, through the blessing of the backpacks, and now as we turn to, to worship you with our offerings. Lord, bless these ties through the work of your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen.
let us continue worshiping with opening our hymnals to number 140, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Let us remain standing for the reading of the gospel this morning. From John chapter 6, verses 35, 41 through 51. Hear now for the word of the Lord. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I will raise up that person on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and will not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. 
and let us pray. Lord, I thank you for your scripture this morning. And I, pr- I thank you for the chance that we can study it. I pray that your words will be spoken. It's your holy name we pray. Amen. We are continuing in John chapter 6 today with our series on the bread of life. I know this passage sounds awfully familiar to last week's, but I promise it is not a repeat. It, last week, Nathan spoke about how, the, how God is a free, or Jesus is a free gift from God. And this week focuses on how God draws us to Jesus. And then Jesus goes on to explain that he is the bread of life, and that bread satisfies all hunger and also grants eternal life. The book of John is full of Jesus' large and ambiguous claims, like the one today in which I am the bread of life. In the other three Gospels, we get things like the kingdom of God is like a pearl, a mustard seed, or something like that, but not in the book of John. John gives us these big statements, these big I am statements. I am the bread of life. I am the bread that came down from heaven. I am the living bread. And in the book of John as a whole, we get others that I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. And I am the way, the truth, and the life. Needless to say, there's a lot of them. Can you imagine Jesus coming up to you and saying these statements? I highly doubt we would be able to make much sense of it. It's almost as if Jesus goes out of his way to make it sound a little extra confusing. I think we can understand the Jews in this story. Jesus started by promising that they would never be hungry and never be thirsty. And so they want some of that bread. But now he's telling them that he is that bread and that he came from heaven. How are they supposed to eat that? Eventually, these people start to recognize Jesus, and it all begins to make sense in their minds, and the wheels start to turn. This is Mary and Joseph's son. Oh, we know him. That's the Jesus who grew up down the street by the community seminary. He went to the rival high school. We know this Jesus. He's just the boy next door. There's nothing special about him. Are we really to expect that this Jesus is also God and can provide everlasting food? Do any of y'all ever get similar questions from old neighbors and friends? People who knew you well and are shocked to find out you grew up to be an accountant, a school teacher, a doctor, or something like that. Or maybe we know better in the opposite end when we see people that we grew up with who became lawyers, who, but they were sat in the back and got C's all the time. We ever think, how did that happen? I imagine what my old neighbors would say about me and growing up to be a pastor. Matthew, the kid who used to pull pranks on us, who used to wake us up early in the summer to make us play kickball. Matthew, who overfed our goldfish that time we were on vacation. That Matthew became a pastor. I promise the goldfish was an accident. I think we've all had these people in our lives. And how much harder must it have been for the people here in this story, Jesus' neighbors, to believe that he came from heaven when they have known him for so long? It's actually pretty ironic, isn't it? They know Jesus and his family, yet that knowledge keeps them from understanding that Jesus is not your average carpenter's son. I wonder if we suffer from that familiarity too. When it comes to Jesus, we like to treat him like a buffet. We load our plates up with the stuff we like and the stuff we are familiar with, but the stuff we see that we don't like or have never had before, we kind of keep them off our plate. We like Jesus to be comfortable and familiar like the people in this story. But maybe there are other parts of Jesus that we overlook as well. Jesus says in verse 43, Do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me except those who have been drawn. And another translation I read, that instead of saying drawn, it says dragged. In the same manner as like a fisherman drags in a fish on his line. God as a fisherman. And there's comfort in knowing that. And knowing that even if we don't fully understand Jesus, he's willing to go out and drag us back in. But it's also kind of scary thinking that hook can be kind of sharp. We may not be ready for it. So we have these people coming to Jesus who obviously are missing his meaning and have no idea who he really is. But just because Jesus is drawing them in doesn't mean he makes it easy for them. Instead of stopping to explain who he is and his meaning of I am the bread of life, He makes the claim even more bold by saying that he came down from heaven. Jesus doesn't seem very interested in making it easy. But what Jesus does do for them is he pulls from their tradition. 
to relate to them in their own way. He uses the story of the time of Moses in which God rained down manna to provide for the Israelites. He uses what is known to them to explain what is unknown. After Moses and the Israelites fled Egypt, they wandered in the desert with no food, so God provided for them by bringing down manna every morning except on the Sabbath. The parallel between manna and Jesus is so beautiful. They are both gifts from God, rained down from heaven like manna, and we are both dependent on it. We are dependent on Jesus like the Israelites were solely dependent upon God for their nourishment in the desert. Nathan laid out last week all the ways in which we were dependent to God. We couldn't last three weeks without food, not a hundred hours without water, and no more than a few minutes without air. God made us dependent, and God made us needy. The Israelites from Exodus knew this dependence firsthand in an amazing way. They got to see the manna drop out of heaven every single day. Yet the Israelites in Exodus and the people in today's passage found ways to complain. They took something extraordinary and tried to make it a little bit more ordinary. The Israelites wanted a better variety of food, and they complained to God. And the people in today's passage rationalized that this Jesus can't be God because we know his parents. We love to try and figure out God's gifts by rationalizing it, don't we? This Thursday, Nathan and I attended a banquet in Montgomery. It was the Stegall Seminary Foundation banquet. We both in seminary benefited from this banquet that, or this foundation that provides for seminary students financially. The founder, Dr. Carl Stegall, stood up and began to tell this story about one of the times early in this foundation's history where he had come into some extra money and then he felt the Holy Spirit lead him to give it to a student with two children. He pulled out his list of seminary students and tried to match that description with a student. He eventually found one. He met with that student and gave him $20,000. And the student broke down and cried, and he said he and his wife, just a couple of days earlier, had prayed for financial support just several days earlier. And it turns out when they matched up the days, it was the same day that Dr. Seagull had gotten that message from the Holy Spirit to look for a student with two children. While I find this story extremely beautiful and extremely moving, I can't, I'll be honest and I'll confess that I sat there trying to figure out how it happened, you know, in a more common sense type way. Did someone tell Dr. Seagull of this student's troubles? Did he already know and he just forgot? It is so much harder for me just to believe that it is divine intervention and a divine intervention given as a gift than it is to make sense of it in another common sense type way. This bread that is Jesus is a gift to us. And it is an extraordinary gift that cannot be rationalized away. It is not something we can earn, not something we deserve, because that's just not how it works. We are given the bread freely, and that can't be rationalized. So why are we still hungry? What is it we are eating on? A former professor of mine and a former United Methodist bishop said, our hungers are so deep that we are dying of thirst and starvation. We are bundles of seemingly insatiable need rushing here and there in a vain attempt to understand our emptiness. Our culture is a vast supermarket of desire. Can it be that many of our desires are, in the eternal scheme of things, pointless? Might it be true that Christ is the bread we need, even though he's rarely the bread we seek? Maybe it's because we are so full of other things that we don't look to Jesus for bread. I heard it once said that we all have a Jesus-filled void inside of us, and that we need Jesus to come in and fill it. Yet we try and fill it with other things. Or maybe it's because we're already so full of other things, other food, other material items, full of stress and anxiety that Jesus doesn't have a place to fit. I'm reminded of my niece who is one year old and who has the toys where you put the shapes inside of each other. I've heard trying to uh, sh like shove a square inside a circle. It just doesn't work. And in the same way, when we try to cram other things inside us and that Jesus will go avoid, it just doesn't work. Anything other than Jesus will leave us completely unsatisfied. Are our souls so depraved that we readily jump to any other substitute? Once I was in Honduras, and we had gone out to the edge of the city to the town dump. 
And uh, it's the capital city, so the dump was huge and stretched out for probably a mile or more. And a community had begun living there. They would daily seek the new trash. They'd go through looking for food or looking for items that we could sell or they could sell. And so me and the people we were with, we went out to give them food. And, I mean, they just swarmed the bus. I guess it's something that had happened before because they knew as soon as we pulled up to come, come to us. So we made bread, we made sandwiches, we had chips, and we handed it all out. And they ate it gratefully, and they went back to diving back into the, the dumpster. Is our desperation so deep and so hungry that we'd eat anything? We would dive in the dumpster just to fill our bellies just for a moment. And maybe that's what we're doing with ourselves spiritually. To see what the bread means to hungering persons is to know the radical quality of Jesus. To know what he means by I am the bread of life. And into that hungry world and into our hungry souls, Jesus says, I am that bread. Jesus doesn't want us to starve, nor does Jesus want us to fill our lives so full of room that God has no place. Ultimately, in this story, manna was a temporary fix for the Israelites. If anything, it could only point to the greater need that they needed for something lasting and something more sustaining. And our souls can feast on that more sustaining, that longer-lasting bread. The original manna didn't cost Israelites anything, and presumably it was an easy thing for God to give to them. Receiving the ultimate manna, that is Jesus, is a free gift to us. It doesn't cost us anything. We've heard there's no such thing as a free lunch, but this is free. While it may be free for us, though, it ended up costing Jesus everything, and it cost him his life. Jesus was broken for us that we could have eternal life. The meal our starving souls need the most is Jesus. And our part in it is simply to believe it and receive it and to take part in it. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the gift that you give us, yourself. Lord, our souls are hungry and they want you to come in. Lord, be with us this morning. Be with us throughout our weeks. Help us to see what our souls are feeding on. And help us to see if it's not you. Lord, help us to understand that we can't just rationalize you away. That you are here, you are with us, and you are with us always. Ready to feed us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Let us open up our hymnals to our closing hymn.
Let us leave today knowing that every hour we need Jesus. Go in peace. Thank you.